Hi, it's Jocelyn. In this series, I'm going to code a project from start to finish, live for all of you. I hope you enjoyed my Advent to Code uploads, but they don't show you how to code larger applications that get used by others. If you are interested in seeing me build an app from the ground up, this series is for you. In this series, I'm going to be working on a voice journal and audio analysis toolkit for people who want to change the way their voice comes across. In this first video, I'm basically going to make a command line version of the Voice Memos app on Apple platforms, which is similar to the Voice Recorder app on Windows. Basically, it will let you record and play back audio clips. To do this, we're going to cover audio I.O., very basic database management, and command line argument parsing. We're going to start very simple and add complexity as we go along where we need it. In the next few videos, I'll talk about audio compression encoding and decoding and make our command line app a bit more fully featured. Later on, I will also be building a UI and the main point, diving into audio processing and analysis. So let's get started. I'm going to call this app Oxygen, which may make sense for some of you in this space, but don't worry if it doesn't. Um, and we're going to start with command line argument parsing the most popular NOC is, um, library for this in Rust is called CLAP. Um, they are right on the verge of releasing a new version. Um, so we're going to use that. The main thing that version 3.0 has um, is built into CLAP itself. It has a way to take a struct and add a derived macro to it. Um, and with that derived macro, um, with that derived macro, uh, like parse the command line arguments into that structure. It's very convenient. It's a lot harder to get wrong, so we're going to do that. It requires that we set the derived features in um, in cargo.toml. So let's do that. And while that's installing, um, I'm just going to go over why I'm making this. So like many others, I just could not stand the sound of my voice. Uh, but it's not until fairly recently that I learned just how flexible our vocal systems are. With the risk of being a little bold, with enough training, it's possible for most people to develop their voice to take on the character of another voice they like. The main limitation is that it can be physically impossible to develop a darker, more boomy voice than your vocal track supports, but otherwise, we're just incredibly flexible. Uh, vocal training feels a bit like a game. The core loop is recording a sample, analyzing it, both with my ear and with software, trying to change some aspect of it, and then repeating. I'll go over exactly what I'm trying to change in future episodes um, when that comes up. But progress is slow, uh, so it's also important to look back weeks or months to see improvements and stay motivated. Um, Everyone is different, but for role playing, this kind of chain or like developing a, a voice for a character doesn't need to be perfect. That seems to take like in the tens of hours. Um, for me, I've drastically changed my voice. Um, this is my voice now, even without thought. I practice so much that apparently I literally talk like this in my sleep. Uh, this has taken me a few hundred hours of dedicated practice, and that seems pretty typical for people like me, but singers, voice actors, and people who talk all day tend to be just a little bit faster. So software can help visualize or measure the aspects that I would need to work on, but my current setup is a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine. And so I hope I can make training a little bit more accessible, organized, and addicting. So now that we have our dependencies installed, that was good timing, um, I'm just going to go to the repo here. Um, so when you're looking for examples in the repo, it's important to make sure you're looking at the right version. Um, Master right now has version um, version three, which hasn't been released stably yet. And so just like check the um, check the change log um, to make sure you're in the right version, or to make sure that there isn't any huge changes. Um, a lot of repos have tags for all the versions, which is super helpful because we can look at like the examples that were written at the time that version three rc nine was released, for example. So by pressing T, I can search for things. There's a whole bunch of different examples here. Um, one particularly useful one is the git derive one. Um, basically, this is um, exactly the kind of thing, things that thing that we'll want for our command, we'll want or for our program, we'll want people to say like um, oxygen record or oxygen play, um, kind of like 
kind of like how Git works. So this is very similar to what we want. It's a great start. Um, so we do have a readme prepared, which will be helpful here. Um, just paste that right here. And this is kind of the what we want to build. All right, so I'm just going to copy this example to start with, for the most part. Um, we have our imports. Um, and then we have our structure for our command line subcommands. Um, so we're calling this oxygen. And the voice journal and audio analysis toolkit for people who want to change the way their voice comes across. All right, um, so here um, these doc strings here are actually converted into help with, with the drive macro, so that's kind of helpful. Um, for starting, we have our commands here. We have record, which takes um, a name, which is optional. Um, let's see. If not specified, the current date and time will be used. We'll get into that. Okay, so let's record. Um, since this is optional, arc required else help doesn't make doesn't make sense. Um, that's close enough. Um, next command is list. Arc required else help also doesn't make sense here. This is going to because there's no arguments for now. This is going to just list all of the recordings in our database. Um, okay, next we have play. Arc required else help make does make sense here um, because there the the name of the song to play or the clip to play is required. Um, it's a bit silly, but just for completion. Okay, and next we have delete, which has the same argument as play. All right, so then the next thing in this here is um, let args equal cli.parse. And this will give us, this will take the command line arguments um, that we pass it and create a nice CLI structure for us. Um, just this derived macro for the parser is really lovely. Um, so first of all, I just want to print what the arguments are just to see if it's working. So we'll have to also derive debug um, so that we can actually print something. Otherwise, um, otherwise that won't compile. So now we can do cargo run. Oh. did mean option, that's right. All right, so we have a beautiful, just like help screen here. I see I said delete, delete. Um, when we just, oops. when we just run it like this, um, we, uh, we just get the list of argument or list of subcommands. Um, if we do like record, then we see like it prints uh, prints something like this, um, and we can give it a name, and then that's passed into name. Um, seems like it all just works. Um, play also, so play it. The subcommand is required, um, so that looks good. And we got all that basically for free. So clap is fantastic. Okay, the next step 
is actually recording and playing back audio. Um, so, well, actually, before that, we can match on the we can match on the command. Um, so there's a missing arm, which there indeed is. So we have commands record, which takes a name. Um, and we'll fill that in soon. And then there's list, which takes nothing. There's play, which also takes a name. And there's delete. So now this should cover everything. Okay, um, sorry, I got that backwards. And we'll just print what we're doing and say that there's more to do. The to do macro just is the same as panic, it just is a little bit more clear about why we're panicking. We're panicking because we haven't done that yet. Um, and playback something. And you can delete something. There we go. Um, the next thing we're going to implement is actually recording and playing back. So there's a um, project called Rust Audio. And they have a number of different crates that help with all things audio related. Um, CPAL is a cross-platform library for uh, getting audio and playing back audio. So this is what we're going to use for recording, um, uh, for recording and playback. Um, so I'll just go to Crates.io. And we'll install that. Um, so again, we want to look for an example. We have some examples here, that's great. There is one which is feedback, um, which is handy. It shows how to get an audio stream and, pa and pass that to another audio device. Um, but probably more useful for us is the record wave. Um, or probably closer to what we actually want is the record wave, just for like the first um, first part of all of this. So I'm going to make a new struct called audio clip, or a new, um, new file called audio clip. And it's going to um, it's going to implement a structure for storing our audio data um, and also for and also have methods for re recording and playback and more as we go along. Um, this is still taking a sweet time. Um, let's see. So an audio clip will have stamp well, while it's still in song, the audio clip is going to have samples. There are various formats we can use. We're just always going to use um, use a vector of floating point numbers. So this is like the waveform data. Um, all the values are going to be between negative one and one. Um, this is going to be a mono, um, like raw mono, raw mono audio data. Um, just because for voice analysis, we don't really care about like where the sound is coming from. Um, there's, we don't get really any more information from stereo, so we're just gonna store our mono. So there are different sample rates that you can um, that you can store audio data in. Um, the most common ones are 48 kilohertz and 44.1 kilohertz. Um, we're probably going to need to be able to convert between those. Um, but point is, like, you can't just take any audio data and play it back at a sample rate other than what your audio device supports. So we need to keep track of that. Um, there's also, um, and actually, that's all we need to get started. So we'll just go with that. With that. It looks like this now um, 
has finished it's finished checking downloading and checking all of the um, all of the uh, what's it called all of the crates we've installed so we can start with our autocomplete and stuff now so the first thing we're going to implement is a record function which is going to um, actually for now we'll just do this return a new audio clip. And this is going to look very similar to our example here. So first of all, we're going to get our host. Um, so in some platforms, there's multiple kinds of like audio systems. For example, on Linux, there's like Elsa or Jack. We're just going to use the default one. So on Linux, that would, that would not be Jack. Um, if we were doing like so none of this is like particularly intensive audio processing or like needs needs anything fancy just like getting the default device is fine or the, the default system is fine just to keep things simple we're also going to use the default audio device if you want a different one um, then you can change your system's default device in the future, we may want to also um, support like changing a device, like in the UI or something. But for now, I think just using a default one is fine. Um, so we see here that the use is expect. For now, crashing is fine. However, later on, we'll want to be able to make sure that, like when we have a UI, we don't want the app to crash. We want to show the error message to the user if something has gone wrong. So we're actually going to do some error handling as well. One option for this is color error, um, which is um, which is a nice nice crate which gives um, which gives error types which gives a result type that can basically um, convert any air type or any result type with any air type into a report and it can print out that report very nicely. Um, this is great for applications where we don't really need um, we don't really need to keep track of what error happened just that there is an error and report that to the user either um, on the command line or later on in like an error message. So the way you use this, is you call color air dot install so that we get nice air messages and then we use the result type everywhere um, so the result type can be imported like this and then i guess the bottom well none of these complete so that's fine um, And so now here, we can actually, instead of panicking when there isn't a default audio device, we can return an error. Um, we also need the error trade over here. So this is an option, not an error, so we'll have to make our own error here. Um, there's an error provides a nice macro for ad hoc error messages. Yes, you can say no input device. Okay, going back to the example, they actually print the device name. I like the idea of that. Um, then they get the config. So I'm just going to make sure this compiles. Oops, we can do that later. Device dot default input config. It's saying that we don't have some traits in scope, so we're going to add those traits. Okay. 
sorry, what I meant here is okay or else, I think. And I'll just add a to-do so that it doesn't complain about the type as we're going along. Um, so here it uses a writer. We're just, which is a um, thing to write to a wave file. We're not going to do that. Um, yeah, so that returns a result to get the item out of result and return an error. If there's an error, you need that question mark. Um, let's see. Oh, nope, this is right before. Because OK or else returns an error. OK, so after a config, after we have the config, we're creating this writer. Um, we're not using a writer, we're just making an audio clip. So we have samples, which will just be an empty back to start with, and we'll add to that. We need the sample rate as well. Um, so we'll go to the documentation here and try to find the sample rate. That looks like it's part of stream config, so or part of the config. So maybe in. Yep, that looks good. And if we look at the type of sample rate, it has it just wraps a U32, so we can just do dots here to get the sample rate. Okay. What next? There's a line that says that we're beginning to record. That seems helpful. We'll do that as well. Um, we're wrapping this in an RQB text. This allows us to keep a copy of clip in our or access clip in our own thread. There's no copying going on. Access clip in our own thread and in other threads. Um, so usually in Rust, you can you can only have mutable access to something in one place. But if you use an Archimute text, you can lock it, and that will lock until nobody else is using it, and then give you mutable access. Um, this is all in the Rust book if you're curious about this. But basically, we're going to wrap clip in that. And it also did an option. Um, we're going to just keep this example the same. Okay. So now we need a clip to give the other thread. So here it says clone. This is cloning the arc, the arc mutex, not the actual clip. So this is another. This is another. Um, variable that can give you access to this underlying structure. And if you modify it in one place, it gets modified in the other one as well, because they are the same thing. Um, next, we are going to start the stream. OK. Let's get that formatted. OK. Here we called it clip, not writer. And we need to. Um, Need to implement our write input data function. They have a type for clip just because it's a fairly complex structure. We don't want to refer, we don't want to um, need to refer to that all the time. So it's an arc mutex option audio clip. And one, two, three, one, two, three. So we'll say. What should we call this? We'll call this clip handle. Okay, so here there are two types. There's a type that we're writing to, or we're getting from CPEL, and the type we're giving hound, uh, which is the wave writer. We only need one type here because we're always using U32. Um, all right, so this is what I was talking about in terms of getting access to the clip. Once we have access to the clip, we can write to it. Um, so for sample and input.iter, we can just push clip.samples. 
pop push sample. So what is a sample? Um, I guess we'll look at this. It can be a U16, an I16, or an F32, and fortunately there's a 2F32 function in all cases, so we can just do this. Okay, the next thing to keep in mind here is that we are only um, interested in mono data. So if there's more than one channel, we do not want that information. We just want that one channel. Um, so to do that, let's see. We can get the number of channels probably from config. That's at least what I'm guessing. Wonderful, and we can pass that along. Okay, so we want to um, just read from um, Let's see, is there like a, should be a chunks thing, right? Consider. Oh wait, um, no, chunks is on vectors. Anyway, fortunately, there is a chunks thing on this. So this is a frame. We just want the first thing in the frame. And we said to hear what I meant as channels. And that converts um, a U16 into U sides, which cannot fail. So into a sign there. Okay, now that we have a stream, we're going to play it. We're not actually playing anything back. Play just means that we're starting the stream. Okay, and here we're just gonna go for three seconds. This is all fine. Uh, later on we'll add, or like later on in this episode, I'm going to add um, control C so that it stops when you press control C, but for now, this is fine. So here we need to get our clip. So yeah, unwrap is fine because it starts as sum. If this fails, it's because we did something wrong. And we're going to turn some clip. Okay, again, we need, there's another um, trait we need. Probably should put these all in one line. And there we go, we should be able to use this to record an audio clip. Um, right, we don't have a name yet, but for now we're gonna say. We're just gonna call it untitled. And we'll make it match our documentation later on. Okay, so. We should be able to record now. Now, we're not going to do anything with the clip, just, um, I guess we can print the number of samples. Mm 
I guess we should print over there since right now it's a private field, which makes sense. We want to be able to be careful about how we're creating our, um, our clips, but for now, I said some, I meant okay. All right, this is recording. Wonderful, and it recorded that many samples. That's promising. We can't really tell if it worked until we can play it back, but for now, that looks good. All right, so next is playback. So for this, there's a beep example, which is going to probably help us, but also it's like just fairly similar to our record example. Um, so this is going to be a function which takes self. It doesn't return anything, but it still can fail. So we're just going to return like, okay, if that works. All right, let's see. Okay, so this starts out pretty similarly. We're getting the default host. Um, I'm actually just going to copy this because it's so similar. We're getting the default host, we're getting the default output device this time, and we're getting the default output config right now. All right, um, so, we got our config. Now we're doing the same thing as we did before. Here, there, they've implemented like a, a run function which is generic on the type of um, the type of input we don't need that because um, we don't need that because this kind of logic is going to work just fine for us so it's actually a little bit closer to, um, to what we've done here So basically, I'm just going to copy this again. OK, these are output streams. So I'm just going to rename these to the output. This is going to be mutable, as we can see over here, because that's what we're writing to. You still need the channels. Um, so there's not a good way that I saw to just because because if you look at the at the type of write output data, um, let's see. Sorry, the type of build output stream rather. There is a requirement that these functions be, or that these arguments be static. So that, that means just like always, um, always valid. Um, and so, like a reference itself is not valid once we go out of scope. Um, so I think the easiest way really is really is to clone this. So we need to make audio clip clonable for this. Um, we can be a little bit smarter in the future, but for now this is fine. And actually I'm gonna move this type out because we're now using it in two places. Actually, we don't need everything clonable. Uh, yeah, we don't need everything clonable. We need um, just the samples. So we don't need that yet, at least. We're also going to need to track like where in the playback stream we are. So 
this will just be probably the location that we're at, the U size, and the audio data, which is a vector of F32s. And then again, we're just going to wrap this. Um, so it looks like I didn't copy the error function, but the same thing is valid here. Later in the in the future, we may want to just like stop the streams when we get an error. Um, but for now, we're just gonna for now we're just going to show an error, like on and then try on bravely. Um, missing channels. We're gonna still need that. Okay. Now, of course, we're going. This no longer makes sense. We're playing. We're not recording. Um, we have mono data, but potentially multiple channels, and we want to play on all channels. So to do that, we can do. Actually, this is not a clip anymore. This is our position and. Um, yeah, it's our position and the samples. So we can do for frame in if we had input dot chunks, I bet there is also an output dot chunks mute method. And there is um, with number of channels and then we can just uh, we can just set the samples. So we want something like samples is equal to, oh, uh, these two variables have the same name. Um, we'll call this clip samples. We'll say clip samples dot get i, um, right, that is, i is a reference, um, dot on top or, Zero F32, the floating point number that's just zero. That means that like once we once we go past, if we ever do go past the end of the sample, we'll just give silence. Um, right, and this will use the reference. And this is, and then we need to increment by. Okay, so this isn't working. It's mute T. Let's look at what the sample is again. Um, there's a from thing, so hopefully we can do that. It looks like it takes reference. This is a reference, so I think that's perfect. That's okay to be in scope. Okay. So this mostly looks good to me. Uh, channels, uh, also into here. Okay. So now we should be able to hear back what we're doing. Let's see if this works. Ah, so it, uh, all right, I'm testing. All right, I'm testing. Oh, that worked perfectly. Okay, we got lucky though. It says we're not using the sample rate. So it seems because the output was at the right pitch, it seems that we got lucky and our input and output had the same sample rate. 
um, but this is not guaranteed. Um, so that is something we need to handle. Like, it's very possible that the speakers would want 48 kilohertz, but the microphone is at 44.1 kilohertz, and then the pitch will be wrong when you play it back, and the speed will be wrong as well. So to do that, we need to be able, to, or to handle that case, we need to be able to resample. Um, this will take one audio clip at a given sample rate and return a new audio clip at a new sample rate. Um, and if the sample rate is the same, so then we're already there, we can just clone, we don't need anything fancy. Um, okay, so if we got the sample rate this way in the input, we can probably also do something similar in the output. Um, and here we do samples.clone. Instead, we're just going to do self.resample to the new sample rate. Um, dot samples. And in the case of the sample rates are the same, this looks very similar. Otherwise, um, let's see. Otherwise, we'll need to implement this. But because the pitch was correct, I think we can just play this back and we'll see that it worked okay. Um, right, now we need to make this clonable. All right, testing. All right, testing. So that looks good. Um, so going back to Rust, the Rust Audio project, there is CPEL, which gives you access to audio devices, both input and output. There's another crate called DASP, which gives you a whole bunch of tools for digital audio signal processing. Um, including resampling. Um, it's very modular. There's a bunch of different features, as you can see. Um, and they heavily use feature flags in order to um, ensure that you don't need to install, download and install more than you're actually using. Um, so signal interpolate, interpolation is what we're going to use for converting between different sample rates. So we'll need the uh, we'll need that feature however we can install that. Anyway, I've dug around in the examples and I found that for our use case we need the signal interpolate and interpolate linear features. So I'll just get that installed. Um, and we can, we can start working. Here there is an example um, for resampling. So we will go with this. Um, here it used the sync interpolator, which is higher quality when you're dealing with low bid rates, um, but it's like prohibitively slow for our use case. Um, and oh, looks like it compiled. Um, and a linear um, interpolator is perfectly fine, so we'll be using that instead of the sync interpolator, but otherwise this is going to look pretty similar. Um, so, okay, we had a ring buffer here that we used for sync. Linear does not require that. So instead, we can look, let's see. Can look at linear, and it just takes two samples. Um, so what that's going to look like is just we take the first signal, then we take the second signal, and then we can create a linear interpolator. Okay, 
And then to get our data, um, this from Hertz to Hertz is still we're going to use. So we're going to say signal from Hertz to Hertz. We're going to use the linear interpolator instead of the sync interpolator. And we're going to take our sample rate, uh, sorry, the new sample rate. Sorry, yeah, now it's the old sample rate and then the new sample rate. All right, and this goes on forever, so we just need to take the right amount of samples, um, which is the, the new sample rate divided by the old sample rate. I think I got that right. And then we can collect that into something. Um, specifically in audio clip. And the sample rate is going to be whatever we passed in. This needs to be mutable. And apparently we don't need that. Okay, so I did say resample here, um, but and I'm just gonna show you what it sounds like when we get the sample rate wrong. Um, so I think, I mean, I can check by printing the config, um, but I think we're at 48 kilohertz, so I'm just going to see if resampling this to 44.1 kilohertz causes the problem. Um, so you can see what it sounds like when you get the sample rate wrong. All right, testing. And you can see that is like comically high. Um, so now if we um, add back our resample, now it should be um, now it should be right. Because we put it to the wrong sample rate and then we move it back to the right sample rate. All right, testing. All right, testing. Wonderful, and that sounds totally reasonable. Um, Okay, so the next step is actually saving this in our data in a database. So we could save this in the file system. There's a few problems with that. The first is that um, as soon as you give somebody access to to files, to audio clips on disk, that kind of is a user interface, and we'll want to store a bunch of metadata along with our audio files. Um, so it's good to do that. It also like implies that you can like drag files in there to add, to import them, but we might need more information than that. For for instance, um, having a database just gives us more control over the internal structure of the application, which is good for my sanity in general. Um, we do need to make it easy to export files um, so that you're not like locked into here. But um, that's the main reason for using a database. Um, one option would be to have a database for all the metadata and then some kind of obfuscated format for all the audio clips. Um, for most of our clips, we're not doing compression day one, but once we do compression, most of our clips will be like under a megabyte. Um, for very small things, SQLite claims that it is faster than the file system. Um, and let's see. They do have another article with a table here showing that depending on the page size, one megabyte files are about this are a little bit slower than just being read from the file system, but it's definitely comparable. It's not going to make any difference. And honestly, many file, many clips will be shorter. Um, I, I do think we want to change the default page size um, because for most of things we care about outside larger page size be goods. SQLite's default page size is 4096. 
Um, but other than that, I'm, I don't think we need to really worry about performance. For today, we're going to store just the raw samples in SQL8. Um, later on, that I mean that's really inefficient. So later on, we'll want to um, compress those, but that's a whole can of worms, and this video is already getting long. So I'm going to. Well, first of all, we should install um, our database engine. So we're going to be using SQLite, which is a really nice wrapper around SQLite. Um, so SQLite is written in C. Um, and when you install SQLite, uh, or SQLite is written in C, when you install SQLite, it does compile SQLite along with it. Um, it's very SQLite is very portable, so as long as you have a C compiler for your platform, um, this is not a problem. Um, and there are other ways that we can store files, but this is what we're doing. So we're going to make a struct for our database. And um, it's going to take a connection. Um, from, uh, or it's going to wrap a connection and have like do various things like save, uh, sorry, yeah, like save and load audio clips. Okay, the checking finished. Um, now let's just get that actually. I don't want that to actually do that record loop. We'll just do build. Um, so we need to add our new module to the top of main RF so that it actually gets compiled and we get our completions. Um, so like I promised, uh, we have our database with our connection. Now we're going to implement an open function, which just returns the database. Um, this example here is basically what we want, except instead of opening in memory, we're going to open a file. According to our readme, we've said we're going to use the oxygen.sqlite file in the current folder. Um, so there's open memory, which they use, but we want to actually persist things. So we're going to use the open uh, command um, and it says that it's equivalent to open the flags, read, write, open, create, which means that if it doesn't exist, we're going to create it, which is what we want. OK. Um, here they're using the result type where you, we want to use um, the error result type just so that, um, just to keep everything consistent. Um, it's because of the way it works, this air type will get converted to um, the air type uh, without us having to do anything. Okay, so first of all, I want to set up our schema. If you're not familiar with uh, with uh, with SQL. Um, there's a number of ways you could learn. Just going through the SQLite website it really helped me once I like had the basic understanding. Um, it's really comprehensive. It's kind of a thing we'll be kind of all in for when we're doing uh, technical documentation. Um, but here we're creating a table which will have IDs. We'll have names. Um, actually, we're not doing the yeah, no, we're doing names. Um, you will have the date that it was created on. Um, that's actually date and time. We need the sample rate uh, because that's not stored in our raw data. And you will have the samples. We will need to convert that into, into bytes, um, but that is for later. And if clips already exists, then um, nothing will happen here. I mentioned earlier that we want to update the page size. 
um, there's a page size here that says it supports powers of two between 512 and this number. Inclusive, um, Rescue Light has a way to change pragmas. Using the pragma update function. If you don't specify a schema, it applies to the main schema. There's our page size. And from that table, remember that we wanted to do 192. Now there's another thing, which is, like I said, in the future, we're going to replace samples with some compressed data. So we'll need a way to tell which version the schema of the database is and update it if necessary. Um, SQLite actually has a nice, um, nice uh, tool for this, which is the version user version integer. It starts out as zero. We're just going to set it to one to differentiate between a new file and um, um, and one that's like a, like a pulley Blake um, file or database with no schema and this initial schema. And then in the future, we'll, we'll increment this to two and we'll see if it's one, then we'll need to make some changes to the schema and the data. So you can read this if you want. Okay, and then once we've executed that, we have our schema in the right state, we can return the database. Okay, then we have two other functions, which is going to be a save, which will take a clip. And there's nothing to return, but it will do this. Okay, so now, now we have kind of a um, conundrum, which is we have this name, date, and ID which right now is not stored in audio clip. Um, we could store those separately and like pass, but then we might need to pass around that metadata and the audio clip, um, right? This supports parameters. In this instance, there are no parameters, so we'll just pass an empty, empty array. So we could pass the metadata with the audio clip or we could um, just combine them into one. I'm going to combine them um, just so I think that passing them around all the time might be annoying. Um, so we have the ID of the audio clip. This will be only set after we have um, recorded it to the database. We're going to have a name and we're going to have a date, right, dates. So we could use the standard libraries, date, time, or date things, but they're not very fully featured and there's some issues with them. The um, common practice in Rust is to use a create called Chrono. And Chrono supports, um, uh, Chrono has like a date time um, struct that accepts a time zone. Um, we're going to store everything in UTC. It's still compiling, so we don't have completions, but that's okay. Um, Chrono uses a prelude, which basically is a file which has all of the, which re-exports all of the symbols that the library developer thinks you'll want to use in day-to-day -day use. Um, okay, that's instead of like importing daytime UTC, anything else you need. So for resampling, we will need the ID, which is um, whatever the original ID is. The name also shouldn't change, but it does need to be cloned because strings are not copyable. There's state, and then there's date, which is self dot date. Um, I think that these are copyable, but we will find out very soon. Okay, for recording, again, our ID is going to be none. Um, our date is going to be now. Again, we have UTC because it's imported from the prelude. And then we have our name, which we're going to pass in. Um, we could take a string reference and clone it, but I had just 
you know that we already have that. Um, we already have this as a reference, so might as well avoid an extra copy or an extra clone if we don't need to. Um, so we're just going to pass the name in here. Okay, here though we said um, in the documentation we said the current date and time will be used. Um, so we're going to do that. We have in this uh, read me here some information about how to format um, format a date time. So we're going to take a local date time. Um, I mean, yeah. So we could just import that. Um, the preludes are a lot more important now, like or were more important before um, Rust Analyzer came along and made importing super easy. But it's there's it's it's still nice. So we'll use Chrono Prelude Star. And now we have access to um, local local times, um, and then we're going to do format. And then they say two strings, so I guess format returns like some kind of intermediate type. All right, there we go. Um, and let's see if we can get our database to open. So again, just to talk more about here, if we had a different um, result, or if we use the RustQLite air type here, then we'd need to convert that into whatever air type was used here. Um, but since we're using air results everywhere, it's super easy. We barely need to think about it. Okay, um, let's just see if the database actually opens. Looks like it actually opened. Oh, no. Um, let's see. I guess there's probably, there's no oxygen.sqlite file here, but that's probably because there's nothing, like we didn't make any changes. Okay, so let's implement a save function. Um, where was that? Okay, so we see that there's an execute function here which looks promising. So we'll do self dot zero dot execute insert or replace into clips. So insert or replace is nice because um, if we pass null as an ID, because it says primary key, it will create a new row with a new primary key. But if there already is an ID, um, then it will overwrite that row. Um, I'm going to say ID name date sample date samples. We don't need to to um, list the columns, I just find it um, less prone to error. And these are the arguments that we're going to pass in the next, um, the next argument of execute. Yep, and there are five of them. Um, so here they use params. So here we used a um, just an array, but params is nice because it lets you um, pass in data of different formats. Okay, so we have, okay, so actually all of these types, well, we'll see, but all of these types are private. Um, like we can't access them here. Um, there's advantages to making these types private to the file. It means you can't like, um, can't mess mess it up um, like if all of the if all of the functions here guarantee you to get good data then audio clips will always be in a good state um, but it's easier for our database to just make them public um, since we're re reading since we're reading them um, we can also make like wrapper functions like make a function called ID which returns the ID and that still won't allow you to set it. 
but we want you to be able to override the ID here, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so we have clips.id, and then we have the name. Okay, and then we have the date. So um, Chrono does talk about um, does talk about uh, parsing. So you can do two string, and then you can use uh, parse um, just fine. Um, so from string and to string are the same. So we'll just do to string, uh, and then we can parse it to get the date back when we're reading it. All right, then we have our sample rate. And then we have our samples. This, I think, we'll need to convert into U8s, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, I guess we should make a function here, which is like in code. Um, it's going to take samples as a bunch of F32s and return a vector of your eights. This is going to be stupid. We're going to cut and inefficient. We're going to replace this later, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. Uh, we do know the capacity though, which is number of samples times eight because there are eight. Um, bytes per float. And then we're returning data. So for our sample and samples, um, raw is equal to samples. So there's the two um, big endian bytes. Oh, sorry, I said eight, it's four. Makes sense, U8, F32, 32 divided by eight is four. And then we can say data.extend on slice, and hopefully this will work. I want my reference apparently. Okay, there we go. Okay, and this is fallible. However, if it succeeds, then that's all we have to do. Um, right, so now we should be able to actually save this. So we can record um, we don't need to resample, we can just save that. Oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention is if we're saving, we want to set the ID on the clip. That's why clip is mutable. Um, so we can say if clip.id is none, um, that's actually gives you a really easy way to do this. We can say clip.id equals sum. Um, our connection dot last insert row ID. And this will be whatever ID was inserted. Um, we'll just do try into, and if for some reason the number is, is weird, then we'll get an error, which sounds right. But it's a primary key, so it really should be, uh, it should fit just fine. All right, so let's try recording something and see if it ends up in our database. All right, testing. Oh, I forgot to save. All right. Um, but after this, we actually are done. So we can do that. Um, now there is control flow that goes to the bottom. So we'll need to just return OK. Heat from fire.
um, and we can see that I'm finished. And that there's an oxygen.sqlite file. So, um, oops. So we can run the SQLite repo, and we should be able to do a select star from um, clips. And we can see that we have our new clip. Um, and it's just showing why here. Um, I think it's trying to save our, I think it's trying to save the, uh, the output from a bunch of, um, a bunch of garbage. So let's see. There's probably a way to get the number of blobs, but I'm not, or the, um, the length of a blob in SQLite, but I'm not actually sure what that is. Apparently I've looked that up before. Okay, so it is length x the blob divided by two. Okay, so we can see that there's a ton of data there. Um, so next we need to be able to to load that and see um, see if it we can play it back. So we're gonna make a new function which takes, um, it's going to take a name and it's going to return an audio clip. If all goes well. So here for actually querying, um, this example here is exactly what we need. So we'll say that the statement is equal to our connection dot prepare Then all the columns from clips where name is equal to the argument we pass, and then we will get our iterator. Um, so that is our name. We're passing, and then we have a row that we're going to process. And this is going to be an audio clip. Um, right, there might not actually be an audio clip. Uh, because name has the unique constraint, um, save will fail if the name is not unique, so there should be at most one. Um, Okay, so the ID exists. It is equal to row.get0. The name also exists. Um, we have our date. This will be a little bit trickier. Um, we have our sample date. I will just do that. Then we have our samples. So we haven't actually made a decode function, um, so we should do that. And again, we'll replace these functions with um, less crappy ones later on. Um, so this is going to be similar. We're just going to take the bytes divided by four. Um, so for chunk in bytes, um, it's going to be chunks of four. Um, we're going to take Yeah, we're going to push a new float. And it's we did, we did two BE bytes, where here we're going to use from BE bytes. Um, and this is going to be chunk zero, chunk one, chunk two, and chunk three. Um, and we can call data that's more specific, that's samples. Okay, that should compile. 
So we have our decode row dot get for this one compiles. So we need to do something fancy about our date. So from RustQLite we want a string and we need to convert this into a chrono date. Um, that means we need the prelude in this file. Okay, and the documentation for chrono did go over how to do this. It said it is just parsable. Um, so we can say that it is date.parse. Um, just make sure we get the types right. I'm going to do unwrap first. Um, row accepts a result, but not the results, not like this kind of result. It expects um, it expects a um, a rescue result, which is different, and we'll have to deal with that. We can't just put a question mark question mark thing there like we did before. Um, I'm going to be clear with the type here. I'm going to say. So that it's the back of you eight, and then do this. Um, it also looks like it doesn't do um, doesn't do i32. So it doesn't do u32s, um, and probably only does i32s. So I need to handle that as well. Just easier to do this. Well, actually, maybe that was fine. Let's try that again. Maybe I just forgot the um, forgot the question mark. Okay, we don't want to unwrap though. Um, so we're going to map the air to a rescue air. Um, there are other ways of doing this, like we could do another map after this and then get the correct air type. But just for time, I'm going to say that it's a rescue air of type invalid column type. Um, it's column two. The column is eight and type text. Wonderful. Um, so these can crash. I'm not going to worry about that right now, though, um, because we're improving it in the next version. OK, now that we have our results, um, then you can see if there is any of them at all. What actually, what type is this? Oh, right. It is the result, so we'll do that. Dot next. All right, there we go. Um, so if we do have one, um, I guess click, click this for the results, so we will we need to be careful, but we can say, OK, some clip. And if there isn't any, then that's still okay. There can we're just going to be no clip. 
I'm going to wrap this in there. And that needs to be move on because we're calling next. Okay, so now we should be able to to play something. We should be able to implement this. Um, so we'll say db.load. We have our name. So if we get a club, then we'll play it. And otherwise, we'll say no such thing. So we did um, have a clip here that we recorded, so we should be able to play it back. Looks like we don't actually need a prelude just for parse. No such column data. It probably I probably meant date. Invalid column type blob at index four name samples. So we have ID name type sample rate samples. Or zero, one, two, three, four. Um, hmm. Oh, here we're here we're asking for sample rates from column four when it should be column three. All right, so playback is now working. Um, there's a couple more things I promised. This first is list. Um, so this will just get a list of all of the songs in the database or all the clips in the database. Um, I want to, we could just return a bunch of audio clips. Um, the problem with that is it has, we, we have to encode and decode and it will include all of our raw samples which we don't really need just to list them. So I'm going to make a new struct which is called clip meta, which has the ID, the name, and the date. I guess now we are using chrono. I'm just going to use the prelude again as they recommend. All right, so we're just going to make the function called list, which doesn't accept anything yet. There's no way of filtering, for instance, and it returns a list of sample meta um, or clip meta. Um, so this is going to look very similar to load. I'm just going to copy and paste this implementation, and we'll, there's just a few minor differences. Um, so the first is that we only care about ID, name, and date. We don't care about the sample rate, we don't care about the samples. Um, second is that there's no where clause. Um, I'm going to order them by date. Um, I, think that, I think that the date format we use can be ordered like that. Okay. Um, we're not passing any arguments. Uh, there's no samples. This is a clip meta. There's ID, name, and date. These two things don't exist. Um, and now that we have our iterator, um, we can collect them. So this is an iterator of results. We want a result of vectors. Fortunately, um, uh, fortunately, collect is very smart and can do that. 
So we, we just need to phrase it like this, I think, just to say this really is what we mean. Um, but I think this will work. Right, and um, because this is metadata from the database, we know that ID is set. Um, so to do list, we can just do for entry in database.list. Okay, the data is a little bit tricky. Um, it is in UTC. We want it to be um, we want it to be in local time, which is fine. We can do that. Um, it says here that you use the with time zone method. I'm going to use the local time zone, and then we're going to format it and convert that to a string. Um, again, I like this format. All right, so now we should be able to list everything. Wonderful. Um, we might want padding, so um, let's see. Wonderful. So it talks with a minimum width here, so we just put, um, put colon and then the width that we want. So I'm going to make the first one five. Uh, let's say it means kind of 30 characters, and that the date's kind of 30 characters, just without thinking about it too much. And then we can also make a header um, where we say ID, name, and date. Um, seems as though my formatting is fine. But for now, let's uh, not worry about that and just see what this does. Looks beautiful. OK, we can um, now implement delete. This is going to be another function in database. Um, it's going to also be an execute function, just like save. So I'm going to use that as our example, as our template for this. Um, it will take a name and return nothing. So the syntax for this is delete from clips where name equals our argument. And our argument is going to be name. Wonderful. Okay, so now we should be able to delete things. And we should be able to delete um, that clip. Wonderful, it's empty now. Okay, two more quick things. Um, in our audio clip for our playback and recording, we are, um, we're recording just three seconds and playing just three seconds. Um, there is a 
or in the README, I promised that we'd stop playing when you when you press or stop recording when you press Control C. So let's implement that. Uh, so there's a handy dandy um, crate for this called Control C, which does exactly what you'd expect. Um, here they're using um, a channel. Uh, we don't need to worry about this too much yet, but basically what's going on is it's saying when you press Control C, send a signal to the channel, and then here we're waiting for that signal, and when we receive that signal, we are going on to the next line. Um, so let's just replace that for recording, uh, literally with this example. Oops. Okay. It is still installing things, so I will go up here and just add channel and then literally copy this. This thread can crash if it can't send because then something has gone wrong. Um, this can just be regular error. Likewise, this can be just a regular error. And then we'll actually want to use this trick um, for playback so that, we, so that when playback is over, uh, we can just stop rather than just doing three seconds. So I'm just going to add this to state. Um, I'm going to make um, I'm going to call these done transact or done uh, sender and done receiver, um, and I'm going to pass these into into here, uh, or pass the sender into here, so the sender can say when something has changed. Um, it's still comp okay. So this did compile. Um, just going to finish this. Okay, so it says sender unknown. I'm going to say that this is explicitly a sender of type unit. We're just sending a signal. The fact that something is sent is all the information that we need. The uh, state handler is also going to have a sender of type unit. Um, and so I'm going to call this done. And at the end of this processing, we can say that if i is bigger than um, the number of clip samples, I guess, or equal to, then we can say done.send just a unit. And then uh, we expect this to Actually, if this fails, it means the other thread has died. That's fine. Uh, or like, playback has already stopped. We'll be dead soon too. This loop will stop like soon after that happens. And then instead of this, we can do the same thing we did before, which is done rx receive. Um, here we go. So now we should be able to record a slightly longer clip. Um, so. Let's see here. Oh, I've got a lot here. There we go. I think that was the only error. All right, I am recording a slightly longer clip. This goes on for a little bit more than three seconds, so we need to make sure that it also plays back for more than three seconds.
All right, so I think that's everything. Um, we can record another clip. Heat from fire, fire from heat. And we can list them. Um, let me see that we have two clips. Um, and if we have two clips right now with the same name, um, that what this does is replaces the previous clip. So we'll probably want to change that behavior in the future, but this is okay for now. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's just commit this. So we don't want to commit our database. Um, so we can add that ticket ignore. But otherwise, I think this all looks good. Um, let's go to GitHub. We can create a new repo called Oxygen. Um, we have our readme. Wonderful. We can create our repository, just completely blank. And we can push to it. All right, I hope you enjoyed watching. Um, in the next episode, we're going to figure out how to um, we're going to figure out how to compress our audio so we're not storing so much in in SQLite. Um, see you then.